Thank you, Mark. Thank you for those that were participating and helping us in worship today. Those, all of you who were singing, if you have your Bibles open to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. Um, Andy and Mandy, well, that, you just had to search for somebody for some, with a name like that, didn't you? They made me a, a mask that said, ask me about the gospel. So uh, I'm walking around, you know, with my, my mask on that says, ask me about the gospel. What I found is the only people who want to talk about that are people who already knew what the gospel was. Uh, people who didn't know what that word gospel meant, they weren't too, they weren't too sure about, about that. So I, I came back to him. I said, what, could you make one that says, ask me, ask me about my greatest decision. Yeah, I want to make sure I said that right. Ask me about my greatest decision. Because I thought, people will ask you about that. If you're walking around with a mask on that says, ask me about my greatest decision, uh, they would be intrigued, amen? And uh, I thought, well, bless God, that will be a great opportunity to open the door to, to brag on my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen? Now, if y'all would like to have one of these, they're 10 bucks. Can y'all, so uh, the big man up here, um, he'll, he'll put his wife to work. So, uh, no. <laughs> she'll, she'll get all the glory from it and all the money from it, and he'll, he'll do the work. So, um, but if you would like to have one, um, can I just give you a commercial, too? Uh, flu season's coming, and COVID's still around. And uh, we, we are COVID-weary. Everybody wants it to go away, but it hasn't yet. So, uh, y'all be wise. That's just my commercial. I'm not telling you to think anything differently than you are, to, are now, but I'm here, I'm here to tell you, we need to be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. That's the word of Jesus Christ. And the word literally, if you wanted to translate it, would say shrewd, which means you look at it objectively and you do the right thing in all of the best situations. And keeping you, you, keeping you safe is important to me. And it is for those that are around you too. And uh, if y'all don't want to pay 10 bucks, I'll buy it for you. All right? Good deal? If you'll be a witness for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I'll buy you one. Amen? So let me know. How many of you want one? Raise your hand. I feel like an auctioneer. Do I hear 20? Do I hear 25? All right. We'll get together and we'll, we'll do business. Thank you for doing that. Take, uh, stand up with me. Genesis chapter 20. We're in this series called Faith and Blessing, and I pray that this sermon does well today. I have, and I just want it to resonate in our hearts. I don't want to come and hear another sermon. Y'all got me? I, I, I want to hear a word from God. I just don't want another hear another exegesis, little beautiful outline, all that kind of stuff. I want to hear what it is that God has for us. So um, if you will bear with me, I'm going to read the entire chapter. Verse 1, And Abraham journeyed from there to, to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Sur and stayed at Gerar. Now Abram, Abraham was said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Sound familiar? Happened 24 years earlier. Did not work out well then. It's not going to work out well now. Abimelech, king of Gerar, uh, uh, Gerar sit and uh, took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man. Now, if you wake up and God's giving you a dream and God says you're a dead man, I believe that would get your attention. I, 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 it would mine because he knows who is speaking. Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. And Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. I want you to hear this phrase in verse 5. In the integrity of my heart, in innocence of my hands, I have done this. I did not mean to. My motives were not wrong in this. Abimelech's probably like us. He could probably say that he had sinned many times and probably many times out of selfish desires. But this time he is saying, hey, I didn't do this. I, I, I was following what I was told, verse 6. God said in a, uh, to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this 
in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sin against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Praise God for God's protection there, even when we don't know. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet. He will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, some things you can't put off, called all of his servants, told all these things in their hearing, and the men were very much afraid. Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. And to that in verse 9, this poor soul says, that's right. Amen. Abraham, you are wrong. Verse 10, then Abimelech said to Abraham, what you have done in view that you have done this thing? Abraham said, because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place then they will kill me on account of my wife. And indeed, she is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father and not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, and I said to her, listen to this phrase, they decided this from the beginning. They made a decision and a pact together. Verse 13, it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, and I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me in every place, wherever we go, say of me, he is my brother. That was their plot. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen, male and female servants, gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, see, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. Then to Sarah, he said, behold, I have given your brother. He didn't say his what, your husband. <laughs> He said, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife. Excuse me, Abimelech, his wife, his female servants. Then they bore children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Let's go back to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, this is your word, and I thank you for letting us see this story about Abraham. He is what we are told in the New Testament, the father of faith. And Lord, we all are encouraged to live by faith. We please you by faith. Matter of fact, your word tells us this is the only way we can please you is by living a life of faith. But Lord, I also uh, am grateful that you added to this record not only the great things of Abraham where he uh, fought for Lot and stood with integrity before others, but also his frailties, where he failed in temptation, making wrong choices. Because, Lord, we battle those things every day. So, Lord, speak to us today about temptation. Speak to us today about the areas where we're led to do what we should not do. And, Father, make it personal, make it real, Make it helpful in our daily walk and daily life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. My son um, puts up our videos on the website, and he always wants to put a, a title with the sermon. I'm not very good at putting titles with sermons, but when I was praying over this and, and studying, I just wrote down the tipping point of sin. You know what a tipping point is. I mean, it can go this way, it can go that way. It's just very balanced there. And I find that for a lot of us, we walk that thin line. We get to that place of choosing right. We know what's right. Choosing to do that which is good and God-honoring. Or then there's something else that comes up within us, and whatever it is that that is, it leads us to, to, to go tilt in the other direction, the tipping point. Now, this series is called Faith and Blessing. And in this study of Abraham, we need to understand that we are to approach God, though we've never seen him, but to know that he's real and faith is a life of a relationship with God that allows us to 
uh, look through the lens of that relationship and, and look upon every circumstance. And how we look at that circumstance goes through the lens of belief and trust in a holy God. And to believe that He is and that He can and that He will. And though we not, might not know the answers, though we might not know the how, we know that He loves us and that He will be there for us. And He wants what's best for us. And He has a purpose. And He's patient and He's kind with us when we fail. But, but we look long, not short. We look for obedience. We look for blessing. And that's the tipping point. If by faith we will trust and believe, then there is blessings that will come. But if we move away, that tipping point of sin, and we move away, we will find that there will be difficulty and hardship because we have not learned the lessons of faith yet. All of us are born with certain dispositions in our life. If you were to ask the others around Abraham what they thought of Abraham, what they would say of Abraham, some would say, mighty warrior. Some would say, great man of integrity and thought, very amiable in his spirit. Some would say, he always puts others above himself. He's always subordinating himself to others. But if we want to be honest about it, we can also say, he was selfish, a little prideful and made everything all about him, didn't regard the thoughts and needs of others as well, even those that he loved the most. You see, we have those things within us that God has given us that are great attributes of character. But there's also the other side of that tipping point where those characters, characteristics of good can be uh, taken away by our desires and our fleshly wants. And we can negate what God wants to do in our life. What would people say about us? What would people say? Well, some may say, that's a very kind person. That person's a big-hearted person. That person is a, a hard worker. You ever looked at someone and you just said, now that's a hard working person. Or that's an intelligent person. Or that's a person, you ever heard this phrase, they'll give you the shirt off their back. And you think about all those things. But they could also say, they're kind of petty. Manipulative. They're insecure. selfish and to some of us they'd say well it seems like they're always afraid i think that's one of the reasons why in the new testament that verse that is there god did not give us a spirit of being timid afraid but a power of love and a sound mind he didn't want us to be full of fear but he wanted us to look through the lens of faith and trust in the Holy God. I will tell you in this world today, there are many, 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 many people who are filled with fear. Matter of fact, their mind is working overtime, looking through all the circumstances. And by the way, this has nothing to do with age. I have talk to many young people that are scared to death of COVID. I've looked at others who uh, probably should be more alarmed, but they're just as bold as a termite and going out and they're going to live their life and they're not going to worry about those things. Y'all know what I'm saying? So we need to make sure that we do the things that God would have us, not the things that we uh, think are best for us. We may aspire to the greatest of virtues, but we're taken away in the worst of them. We've all got a sinful nature. 
There's no doubt about it. We're prone to drift. We're prone to wander. And we've got weaknesses in our life. And, and God wants to develop that character. But Satan wants to take it down. Y'all look up here for just a second. I know in this world today, people say, you're super spiritualizing things. No. I'm telling the truth. You see, I believe this book from beginning to end and I believe that there's a holy God that is watching over all. He is the creator all. And he is the God of heaven and earth. But I also know that there were other creations of him who chose to do what was selfish in them. And they are called fallen. And they are alive. And they are in this world. And they follow Satan's direction of selfishness. Now listen. You have, you have proof of this in your life. How many of you never had that negative thought, then all of a sudden, bam, that ugly thought came to your mind? You think that's just human nature? I mean, you're not even, you would never even think of that, but then bam, the, the thought went to your mind. That's because these things that we have used the term calling them demons, spiritual forces, created beings of God that, that chose sin. By the way, the same way we chose sin. Praise God, we have redemption. They don't. We've got the blood of Christ that is there for us. They don't. And their desire is to come, and, and uh, it's said of Satan, to steal, kill, and destroy. And they're following the same thing. So as God wants to develop us and grow us and help us and nurture us, they want to tear us down, steal, kill, destroy. They want to trip you up. They want to trap you. They want to knock you down. And when you're down, they want to kick you while you're down. They want to laugh at you. They want to humiliate you. You see, it's not just that you've got a little weakness in your life. You've got weaknesses that they are pinpointing. Satan has a file that he keeps on you. Y'all good with that? A file. He doesn't know everything. God knows everything. He doesn't know everything. So what's he going to do? Bobby's going to come and say, let me see. Let's, let's open up our, our file on Bob. Let, let's throw this in his brain. Let's, let's put this, it's called temptation. Let's put it in his life. and Let's see how he reacts. You see, there's some things that, that, that when the temptation comes to me, it's not really that tempting. It's not really that tempting. I've worked at I've worked with addicts since 1994, and and I don't understand some of the reasons why. By the way, some of y'all don't either, but it's real what they're going through. They gave into it, and, and because they've gone, they've given into it, it. It's alive in their life. Now, if you came up to me today and say, uh, Pastor, we have got some heroin here with some fentanyl in it. It'll take you to a place that you've never been before. Would you like to take that ride? I'd say no. That doesn't tempt me. Amen? But if you brought me a whole bucket of ice cream up here, and I'm a diabetic, and you said, come on, it's good. There is something that boils up within me, and I want to grab that spoon. And if you stand between me and that ice cream, we might have a fight. Can I get an amen? You see, Satan doesn't know all the areas in your life where he's vulnerable. So he's going to throw different things at you. From the time you're a child. Hey, that worked pretty good. Let's, let's write that down. Let's keep up with that. Others, well, that didn't work. We might try that again later. It didn't work now. And if he's got an area in your life that you seem to be prone to, to fall for, listen now, when you start going good for God, when you start trying to do the will of God, when you start saying, uh, for the glory of God, 
then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these thoughts are going to come into your mind. These desires are going to start to be there. Because he follows the great theologian Barney Fife too. He, he wants to nip the good in the bud and get the bad. He wants to get it working in your life. And if you start trying to look for revival, you start trying to read your Bible, you start trying to pray, you start trying to talk to others about Jesus, all these things will start to come up because he's trying to bring you back down. That's what he's about. That's who he is. He dangles the bad in front of us. He wants us to believe the wrong. He tells us that those things, that, that that's what's good and best. And matter of fact, because of others, I mean, if it wasn't for them, you'd be okay. But, but they're doing all these things and you really don't have any choice. This is what you need to do. Life would be so much better if only. Does that not sound like the Garden of Eden? It worked for them. And by the way, it's worked on me. It's worked on me. And there are times... Can I get honest with y'all? You, I'm, a, I'm a pastor, but I'm a, I'm a sinner, saved by God's grace. There are times that I know what is right. The Bible says to know to do right, not to do it. To him, it is sin. That's tough, folks. There, there are sermons that I have preached that I have not lived. There is encouragement that I've given others that I haven't received for myself. Now, look, I might choose to do the right 99 times, but it's that one time that I choose wrong. That's hard. And praise God that God looks beyond those things. But, but I'm still battling it out. That's the tipping point. The tipping point of sin is Satan leading in one direction and moving us. Sometimes God wants us to do good, but sometimes we just choose the bad. It had been 24 years since, as it says in verse 13, that Abraham <clears throat> and Sarah made this pledge. When we get out there, just tell everybody, you're my sister. Don't tell them, I'm your husband. So, in this particular time, they're out there, and they did what they had done so many times before. They followed a pattern. They followed a, Y'all know we're creatures of habit. The neuros, neuroscientists would call them that neural pathway. We love to do the same things over and over. By the way, it is extremely hard to break those things. We call some of this, we call it spiritual warfare. Because we've sinned in that area. I, I, I think what the Word of God says, and the sin that does so easily beset you, the, the, the old King James, the sin that does so easily trip you up. Y'all know what yours is? Come on, think about it right now. What is that area of vulnerability that you have in your life that, that, that Satan can come in your life and just knock you down? It works. It hits that tuning fork in your heart. And rather than being for the glory of God, you fall into that place of sin. Look what it says in verse 2 here. Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. I wonder if when he said those words that it, it became a foul taste in his mouth. He knew it was wrong, and yet. Why did he not just say, whoa, whoa, whoa. She, yes, she's my sister, but this is also my wife. Because at that moment, listen, in the point of temptation, at that moment, we think that we must sin to preserve what is best for us. What we want and desire in that moment. It doesn't really matter if you're a five-year-old wanting a piece of bubble gum 
or if you're an 85-year-old and you don't want that person to think badly of you. We will move into places that we should not be. Repeated actions of not trusting God, but just doing what you feel is right for yourself. So what should Abraham have done? I want to spend more of my time here. What should Abraham have done? Number one, he should have stopped. When he knew it was wrong, he should have stopped right there. How many of you know what it means when I say the conviction of the Holy Spirit? You know his voice? You know it in your mind? And, and there, that's that point where you know it's wrong, but you want to do it anyway. And, and, and it's like God puts up this stop sign in front of you and says, stop now. To the young people, when someone says, here's a beer. And if you taste this, it's going to taste awful. But it will be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. And in your mind, you're going, no, no, no. Daddy told me no, no. But yet there's something in you that says, I want them, not, I want them to like me, and I want them to, to, to include me and, and, and join me in. So, yeah, I'll take that. <clears throat> My first one was warm. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Praise God for all of you who have no clue what I'm talking about. Praise God for you. I was young, trying to act big. And somebody had me. And by the way, they didn't have a clue either. Ignorance leading ignorance, right? And anybody want to? I know those people over there in Germany. I'm underst I understand that they drink warm beer. God help them right but i took a sip of that and said wow that's terrible but i said out of my mouth wow that's good why in the world do we not just stop and and stand on truth in that mo moment and just say <laughs> praise god for a <laughs> if we edit this out of that video and take that three-second clip, nobody will have any clue what I'm just talking about. Right? The greatest thing that Abraham could have done at that moment, when he the words came out of his mouth, is, she is my sister. And you know God said, you better tell more than that. But he didn't. In that moment, he should have stopped. Here's what we need to do. You want to say, what do we need to do, pastor? You need to pray beforehand. You need to pray constantly. You need to pray beforehand that when that moment comes, please listen to me now, and the Holy Spirit gives you that conviction that you have the courage and the boldness and the strength in God to stop in and correct it. Do it quickly. How many of you know what it feels like to get a shot? And they tell you, this is going to hurt for just a second. I've taken so many shots, I don't care anymore, right? Just shoot me, I don't care. But in that moment, you're willing to take the needle because of the good that will follow. And by the way, it only hurts for a second, amen? Why can't we stop and take the needle of truth? And though it may hurt for a second, it will help us and we'll be forever grateful. Pray beforehand. Don't wait till you find yourself in the throes of temptation and then decide whether you're going to do the right thing or not. Pray beforehand. Pray it five times, ten times a day. That area in your life where you're vulnerable, pray it. Please pray it. Do it before the crisis so that you can stop. Number two. Check out the timing of the temptation. Satan is not a dunce. He didn't come in. Look, when I'm here in this worship service, if you came up and said, uh, Pastor, here's a quart of ice cream, 
I'd say, no, I'm good. You can't, I, I'm, 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 it's like I'm insulated by all of your love and the grace of God while I'm in here. But it's when I'm at home and Lynn's not around. And I'm thinking, chocolate ice cream. And I want to go get the spoon. Can I get an amen? Check the timing. In Abraham's life, last Sunday, we talked about when Jesus came in in the Old Testament and the two angels with him and said, we'll be back next year to celebrate when Sarah is holding the child. Abraham, I will make of you mighty nations. And, and we'll come back next year. She'll be holding the child. After that, they go to this place and he says, she is my sister. And King Abimelech takes her to be part of his harem. Do you think Satan was going, I'm going to get him. I've got, this is good. This is good. They've fallen for my trap. Check the timing of it. Check the timing of it. Satan attacks us when we're weak and vulnerable. So what do you do when you're weak? Number one, you confess it. Number two, you know that in your emotions, you're vulnerable. So go back to the basics. During that time, get back to God and say, Pray that wonderful prayer of Peter. Y'all remember Peter when he got out of the boat and he was walking on the water? And he was, li he was living the miracle. And he got looking around at the circumstances and said, I'm not supposed to be able to do this. And what happened? <whistles> Began to sink. And what did he do during that time? He got it out of his strength into God's strength. He got it out of his sinking into God's saving and said, Lord, Help. One of the most powerful prayers in all of Scripture. If you find that the timing is wrong and you're vulnerable, maybe your emotions are raw, maybe you're mad, maybe you're angry, and you just want to blah! Hear this, hear this well. Know the timing of it, know that you're vulnerable, and get it out of your strength into God's strength. Get it out of your weakness, really, into God's strength. Look for the traps. Look for the traps. Satan wants to trip you up. So you need the Word of God to be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. The more you get in here, the more you'll see the trap before it comes. And the trap is, is quality if it's disguised. Satan will come at you Y'all know what I mean when I say bait and switch? Satan will come at you baiting in this. That's what he did for Eve. Oh, this fruit is good. It's pleasant to look at. It's pleasant to eat. It will make you like God. Wow, who wouldn't want to be like God? But the trap was it broke the close, intimate, personal relationship she had with God. Look for the trap. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 says that we're supposed to take everything captive, every thought, bring every thought unto the obedience of Christ. When the thought comes, take it quickly and move it to Christ. Remember your past. What would have happened if Abraham had stopped and said, you know, 24 years ago we did this and it did not work well. Sarah, we're not doing this anymore. In the book of Revelation, to the church of Ephesus, Jesus wrote to them and said, remember from where you have fallen. Remember your past. Aren't, be grateful for God's forgiveness, but also understand that we learn from those mistakes. If I could ask you to do one thing, sin comes look like this big bow tie on this present just to fulfill your desires. Remember how terrible it felt when you did it before. 
What is it Einstein said about insanity? To do the same thing but expect a different result? It didn't work for Abraham the first time, but he tried it again and it did not work the second time either. Remember, remember. By the way, uh, I added this in with my notes. You need to surround yourself with accountability. The one thing about our sin is we don't want anybody to know that we've sinned. Are there areas in your life that are password protected? Y'all know, y'all know what I mean by that? On our, on our computers and all those things, uh, we'll have files, and you, to get into it, you have to know the password. Are there things in your life that you don't want anybody else to see, so you put a password there so it's only about you? Matter of fact, uh, would you open up your computer and let me go look at it? <clears throat> would you open up your thought life and let me look at it? Is there anything that you, would not, you wouldn't want your pastor to know? Well, hold on. If you don't have some accountability there, if you don't invite some accountability in, you're going to be vulnerable. Be very, very careful of these things. Be careful of lies, what you see. You need to know those things. We need to praise God for his mercy. Look in verse 3. God came to Abimelech at night by a dream, uh, in, in a dream at night, and said to him, Indeed, you're a dead man. He goes on to say, um, She said this to me. He said this to me. I did it in the integrity of my heart. God says, I know. I've kept you from it. I've kept you from her. He said, I, I, I did these things for you. Praise God for his mercy. Mercy, grace is what God gives you that you do not deserve. Mercy is God not giving you what you do deserve. And God gave Abimelech mercy. God gave Abraham mercy. Matter of fact, God blessed Abraham through Abimelech. That's mercy. Abraham sinned, but he came out richer because of it. Because of God's goodness, not because of his sin. And Sarah, she had to stand up and get her part in this as well. Praise God for his mercy. How many of y'all could take some time this afternoon and say, Lord, thank you for not judging me by that sin that I did over and over and over, my failing in that temptation over and over? Don't take his mercy for granted. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9 says, Let us not tempt Christ. Hear me here, and we're going to close this out. Well, I know I'm not supposed to, but God loves me, and God's already forgiven me. I really want to. Be careful of tempting God. Just because God is a God of mercy does not mean that he's going to give you mercy every time. Galatians 6 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows that shall he also reap. Cause and effect, reaping and sowing. Just because God has given you mercy doesn't mean you go off and do whatever you want to and then just say, oh, God will, give, God will give me mercy. God will make me rich because of my sin. Oh, be careful. Be very careful. And what should you do when you see someone else fall prey and they're in this temptations and you're trying to help them? Galatians 6 says, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Restore is kind of like the same word that we would think of with a broken arm. If somebody breaks their arm, let's just say it breaks right here. What you're supposed to do is supposed to go in there and set that thing. And though it may hurt, you got to pull that thing to get it back right in the right place. You do it in a spirit of gentleness, no. You go and help them restore it, reset it. You don't judge them, lest you be judged. That's what he says in the next verse. Don't, be, don't judge them, 
treat them the way you would want someone to treat you if you were in that spot. How many of y'all sin? That's right. How many of y'all going to sin again? <laughs> That's right. But that doesn't mean we should never strive for God to create a new heart in that area of our life. Just because there are areas in your life that you're very vulnerable does not mean that God doesn't want to do a great work there. How many of you are tired of pain? How many of you would love to see God do a great miracle in those areas of your weakness? Satan's going to come. He's going to tempt. He's going to trap you. He's going to kick you while you're down. He's going to come at inappropriate times. You need to surround yourself with the love of God, the accountability of others, praying beforehand, choosing beforehand to do what is right. And what in the world do people do that do not have Jesus? They go off in sin and they blame others for it. justifying themselves in their own thoughts. And that will separate them from God forevermore. I pray that God will add blessing to this word, not only today, but tomorrow, and during the week, next week. Because as long as we're living, we're going to be tempted. Help us choose well. Help us to get it out of our strength into his strength, really our weakness, into his glory. Let's pray. Father God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your goodness and your glory. And Father, we are, we've all been tempted and we've all failed. And Lord, help us. Lord, we know that you're close. We know that you're a whisper away. Thank you, Lord, for having our back. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and giving us mercy, bestowing your grace where we do not deserve it. And Lord, we're going to battle this spiritual battle. But I pray, Lord, that we will develop our character into more of you and work on those areas where we make it all about us. And Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know you, as Savior, they have not decided to believe and trust in you and to follow you and to give their life to you. Lord, uh, I wouldn't want to live that life. I wouldn't want to face life and death without you. Thank you, Lord, for the, the blood that cleanses us and makes us whole, makes us complete and good. Father, you and you alone could use someone like me like all of us. So Lord, just minister to our spirits right now. Your spirit and our spirit being one, talking back and forth. May we hear you. May we speak truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.